Great. Well, um, happy new year, happy holidays. Uh, thank you for coming uh, either in person to UC Davis, veterinary medicine, um, and online out there, uh, wherever everyone is. Um, my name is Maurice Kateski. I'm a veterinarian and cooperative extension specialist at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, my focus is on uh, poultry health and food safety epidemiology. Um, I heard someone mention that it's great that we can do these type of things, and um, it is great that we can do these kind of things. They come with funding, so if you look at the bottom of the first slide, you'll see beginning farmer, rancher, and development program. Uh, so this is all part of a three-year uh, grant that we have to work with beginning farmers on all kinds of challenges uh, associated with uh, pastured poultry. So we're collaborating with uh, NCAT, um, and Ann Fire from NCAT is here, and we'll uh, speak to NCAT a little later, maybe at the beginning of our roundtable discussion, and also with the Center for Land-Based Learning um, based in Winters, California. Um, so before we get started, just want to go over just a couple housekeeping uh, things. Uh, so if you're in the building here, restrooms are located in the hallway. So uh, just basically on the other side of this wall, you'll see restrooms uh, halfway down the hall. Food and drinks are available in the back. Please help yourself. Um, please fill out our pre and post workshop surveys. This is what we use to uh, understand um, uh, what people uh, know, don't know, what they like, what they don't like. So um, this is really important. Um, ask lots of questions. So I will repeat your questions for the people online. We have about 30 or so people online that are participating. So uh, feel free to ask questions. Questions are good. Uh, I always tell people the most important part of these meetings is not what you learn in the workshop, but the contacts that you uh, develop in the workshop. So we all know each other now. Um, you guys know my contact email. Um, I'll show you before we get too far into the presentation some resources that are available to you. Um, but emails, phone calls, um, those are great ways to get a hold of myself and I know all the other speakers here. Um, behind, in addition to the speakers you'll hear today, there's a bunch of other speakers that are uh, uh, experts in all kinds of other areas. So um, even if I can't answer the question, which usually I can't, I know a lot of resources and, and, and people who can help out. Um, parking, if you haven't bought a permit, please do so. Um, so parking at UC Davis um, is expensive and there are a lot of parking enforcement, especially at the beginning of the new year. So uh, make sure you buy a permit. Uh, it's then it's up, up until 10 p.m. on campus um, when you um, have to have a permit. If you're online, uh, please let us know if you can't hear the speakers well. Um, so what the speakers will speak up. We have someone kind of monitoring the online chat room uh, to make sure that you're able to, um, that, 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 that we're, we're communicating with you. So make sure you use that chat um, interactive uh, tool on Zoom. Ask questions at any time by hitting the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll pass them on to the speakers and the panelists. Um, you should have received a pre-workshop survey by email. Please fill that out for all the same reasons that just previously mentioned. Uh, we'll email a post-workshop survey afterwards. And then for everyone, this webinar is being recorded. So if you give us a couple days, um, We'll edit it and it'll be a link on our YouTube page. Um, so feel free to join our YouTube channel. Right now I think we have about three people, including myself, who participate in our YouTube channel. So more, more is better. Um, and PowerPoints uh, will be available. Just, just send me an email if you need the PowerPoint. Um, we can send it as a PDF um, if that helps you. <laughs> All right. So, um, before we start, um, I'd really like to thank um, Macy Tanaka in the back and uh, Todd Kelman for um, all the logistics they've done. This is part of uh, our third year of this grant and um, the way we've set up January for the last two years is um, on Monday of the first week of January, Tuesday of the second week of January, Wednesday of the third week of January and so on. Um, for the first five weeks of January, we have workshops scheduled in the evening. Um, so feel free to participate in as many as you want. Uh, if you're a UC Davis student, you know, other students are interested and it's free. Um, so uh, feel free to, to pass it along and participate remotely or in person. 
or via YouTube um, and, and, uh, as we move on. So the picture that you're seeing, that's the UC Davis pasture poultry farm. Um, we don't have a flock right now, but we will have a flock in the late spring. Um, so um, people are always welcome out there as long as they haven't uh, had any contact with poultry for at least 48 hours before going there. Um, you can see um, some of the elements of pastured poultry, and we're going to talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of pastured poultry husbandry um, in about the next 20 to 30 minutes. We don't have tons of time, but um, I want to go over some resources. And uh, we have one of the great things about being at a university is that we have all kinds of experts in engineering and poultry and husbandry. Um, so we have some very clever people kind of working on coop design, uh, rotational systems, um, data analysis, data capture. And um, I'm going to just highlight, hopefully, some of the things that, that you might think about that, that might be um, useful. One thing I do want to highlight is you'll see the three people over there in the corner there. And they've all got hair nets and rubber boots and coveralls on. And um, this is pretty standard. And I know we have some um, um, people that are going to, that are uh, true farmers that are going to speak later. And uh, this, is, this is a challenge in a pastured poultry environment to, to have a biosecure environment. Uh, diseases from wildlife um, are very common and they can kill a lot of birds. So in Southern California right now, you might be familiar with the virulent Newcastle disease outbreak that we're having. We've had avian influenza in California a few years back. Um, so these systems have challenges. There's advantages also. Uh, but one of the challenges separating these, these birds, uh, the domestic birds, uh, from uh, waterfowl, for example, which can carry avian influenza. So it is a challenge and uh, using uh, hair nets and rubber boots and um, Tyvek suits are one of the ways that, that you should consider trying to reduce um, how diseases can be transmitted from point A to point B. So if you go to a feed store and you've got the same shoes on, that you then take um, onto, your, onto your farm, you can transmit disease. And humans are probably the worst transmitters of disease um, as far as movement of disease on and off a of farm. So it's something we really need to be aware of and, and do the best we can to mitigate um, disease transmission. So as I said, I'm really, really informal. So uh, whether you want to ask questions now or email later, come by my office, call, whatever it be, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, with questions. Um, so I just want to have one slide on what cooperative extension is. So I went to vet school at UC Davis and uh, I didn't know what cooperative extension is. And cooperative extension is, this is a resource for all Californians. Every state in the union has cooperative extension specialists like myself that focus on all kinds of things, but basically practical applied research to help farmers um, are, are, are kind of, is kind of one of our, uh, our broad mission statements. Um, and I really want to highlight that the research we do, the outreach we do, is really focused on helping you guys. Um, so it's just something, even if you're outside of California, you can certainly contact me, but your state most likely has someone like me um, that focuses on poultry, for example. But there are other cooperative extension specialists throughout the state um, and throughout uh, the United States that focus on a whole range of different um, types of activities that um, hopefully are useful. Um, so just moving on, um, I want to highlight again some of the resources you have available. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I want to make sure we have time for some of the other things. But if you do type in on Google UC Davis and poultry, uh, you will get to the UC Davis pastured poultry uh, website and the UC Davis um, um, poultry uh, website. And I just want to highlight, you know, we have a lot of different projects that we do work on. So um, if you look on the bottom left where you see research, um, there's hyperlinks there to how to process poultry data. Um, so how to capture data, because if you're not capturing any data about your farm, how are you going to know if you're profitable? How are you going to know if your egg production goes down? How are you going to know um, if the, 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 the birds that you're feeding are gaining weight or not gaining weight at an adequate rate, for example. Um, we have uh, projects there on black soldier fly larvae, so that's become a really interesting hot topic of like, can we use black soldier fly larvae uh, to displace some of the corn and the soy that we're typically feeding um, poultry in the United States and beyond. 
um, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of hyperlinks there to some of the research projects that we're doing. Um, I always like hearing what people are interested in, what research projects they want covered, uh, because that helps kind of guide some of the directions that we can go into. And sometimes we're already doing that, and sometimes you guys come up with ideas that you know we haven't really thought of. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a really nice way to kind of find out what other people are doing. On that middle pane there, um, it's probably, you know, probably the most commonly asked question I have is I have dead birds or I've got a welfare question or I've got ectoparasites in my birds. Who do I reach out to? And we've got information on our website on all those types of questions. But if you've got a really high end sophisticated question, uh, we've got experts throughout the state that can really help you. I am going to talk a little later about the calf slab. So if you look under the diagnosis box under dead birds, if and when you have a sick or dead bird and you want to find out what's wrong with it, uh, we have four diagnostic labs in California. If you're listening to this outside of California, uh, your state most likely has diagnostic lab services. And those are uh, poultry pathologists um, that will open up the bird and do a necropsy or an autopsy on your chicken um, with the goal of figuring out what was wrong with the bird. Was it nutritional? Was it a bacterial disease? Was it a viral disease? So you can protect the rest of your flock. Um, so that's a really good resource. And um, if you look at the bottom, you can find veterinarians that can help you, private veterinarians, if you're not in Davis, for example. Um, we have all kinds of resources in the state. Um, if you have ectoparasite questions, there's uh, contact information uh, for a poultry entomologist at UC Riverside, who's an expert in you know, how to control mites, for example. And then if you go off onto the right side, you can see some of our additional resources. So if you want to understand or better understand if you have salmonella in your flock, some of the salmonellas that'll make humans sick, um, we've got resources on how to test for salmonella enteritis. If you want to learn how to vaccinate your birds against Merrick's disease, which is a very common uh, viral disease, a herpes disease um, that has no cure, you can go onto there and go to their Merrick's disease pam pamphlet. If you want to learn about building an egg mobile, that one that I showed you in the first picture, um, that's also in the top left here under, um, under uh, this part right here where, the, where our pastured poultry farm is. Uh, we've got instructions on how to do that and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of resources there. Um, if it's too much or uh, something that's not there, you don't know where it is, again, feel free to email or call me. Um, we have a newsletter, Poultry Ponderings. So feel free to sign up for that newsletter. Um, you can see some of the articles. We have a new mobile coop that we designed a couple years ago. We've got information on virulent Newcastle disease there. So when you go onto the website, you just type your email in under our newsletter and um, you'll be added to our poultry ponderings um, uh, newsletter. And that comes out quarterly. It gives you information, again, everything poultry related at Davis, Riverside, Berkeley, um, and, and, and gives you hopefully some information about upcoming workshops and things like that also. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we do have a resources section with research articles there. And I know sometimes when you see a research article, you're like, oh God, like this is you know, way too much detail than I want to know. Um, and sometimes that's true. And you know, it's, it's, it's our job to kind of, um, I'd say, refine all that information and, and make it accessible to you. But I just want to describe, there's one paper, you know, there's a couple papers that I wanted to just highlight. And here's one titled Descriptive Survey and Salmonella Surveillance of Pastor Poultry Layer Farms in California. And you know, the, the, the reality is that we know a lot about conventional commercial poultry production. And there, there's a lot of information about how to be productive in those type of systems. And for lack of a better word, those systems are kind of cookie cutter, right? Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. That's just the way they are. Everything is, is much more standardized. And when you move to these pastured poultry systems, you have a lot more uh, variability in husbandry, in breed, in nutrition, and it, it's a really challenging system to kind of try to understand. So this is a paper that tries to kind of understand, you know, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the things that producers have, um, have, 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 what are the commonalities and what are the differences? And I just want to highlight a couple things here. If you look down at the fourth, at the third bullet point, predation is the most common cause of mortality. So on these farms, we have a lot of, on these type of farms, we have a lot of predator issues. So as we move into our slides, you're going to see me focus from a husbandry perspective on what are the best ways to mitigate predators, not eliminate predators, but mitigate predators. 
Other primary challenges include feed costs. So feed is about 70% of the operating cost of raising poultry, and that's a really big challenge. Uh, it is even a bigger challenge for commercial poultry producers, uh, for pasture poultry producers, uh, because there's no economy of scale. If you have 500 or 1,000 or even two or 3,000 birds, you're not going to be able to get you know, all the feeds that you need um, in the tonnage that you want at the price you want um, the same way that bigger producers are going to be. And that is a huge challenge and I wish I knew the, the secret answer to, you know, to, to how to help you on that. Other than there are some uh, farmers that are starting to produce some of their own feed. Um, when you do pastured systems, there is an advantage in the sense that you can um, reduce some of their feed demand by uh, allowing them to graze on pasture and the seeds. Um, I think the black soldier fly work that's going on is really, uh, I think has some really interesting potential there um, because I think um, there is the opportunity to, to grow those black soldier flies um, on your farm. And I think there's a, a real um, protein is the most expensive part of your feed. And if we can grow black soldier flies, um, which are a great protein source that have specific amino acids that birds need a lot of, including methionine, I think there's a real opportunity there. And there's a lot of companies that are starting to move into that space. Um, the one, the other thing I wanted to highlight is if you look at the bottom, so when you're on a pastured farm, there are two space requirements that you should probably consider. So one is the, the stocking density of the birds that are outside on pasture. So typically you keep your birds inside a coop at night to protect them from predators, to allow them onto some kind of roosting bar, um, and then you let them out during the day. And one thing I thought was really interesting was that the space that they get during the day, 22 square feet per hen, that's amazing, right? That's a huge amount of space. If you look at the new requirements that the California Department of Food and Agriculture put into place starting January 1st, 2020, every single bird needs at least 144 square inches of space, one foot, okay? So this 22 square feet is huge. That's 22 fold more space. That's, that's pretty amazing. However, if you look at the, the next bullet point at the bottom, the median coop stocking density. So now what, what is the amount of space those birds have inside their coops? You're only finding a half a square foot per head. So that would actually be illegal right now. And there is some, it's really interesting when you talk to producers, they would argue that, hey, we're using a nesting bar. The birds are nesting all night. Um, so they don't need that square footage. And I would agree with them except when and if we do have diseases like avian influenza and birds have to be put inside. Um, during those scenarios, we could run into some welfare challenges. So I just thought that was just an interesting kind of, um, kind of note. When you're thinking about your, your square footage, don't just think about the outside square footage, think about the indoor square footage. And there's ways to mitigate this. So um, the, the coop, I'll just go back really quickly. Um, this uh, mobile coop here um, has a significant amount of three-dimensional space in the Z direction. So you could imagine um, creating more square footage in this coop if we had that square footage um, issue um, by, by creating like a second layer or a second floor. And this is what we usually typically call an aviary. And we have aviary systems um, in California that are becoming more and more common uh, because birds are, um, the law is gonna require uh, I think by 2024, 2022, the law, 2022, the law is going to require that all layer birds are raised outside of cages. That everything has to be cage free in California starting 2022. Okay, so um, there's another paper here. I'm not going to go into this too much. The only thing I really want to highlight here is that, um, again, a survey just to try to understand feeding and lighting practices of pasture poultry producers. Um, in California and beyond. Uh, one thing I just wanted to highlight here, feed conversion ratio. So the amount of feed that we have to put into the bird to get eggs or meat out. So we want that number nice and low. Um, only one of the 14 farms that we surveyed was actually even making this calculation. So this is really interesting, especially someone who, who likes to look at a lot of data. Um, for the commercial producers that are conventional, that number would be 100%. Because if you don't understand your feed conversion ratio, it's really difficult to understand how much you should sell your eggs for. And I think the challenge for a lot of farmers um, is 
you know, you, you want to charge, you want to obviously make sure that your farms, that your product is profitable as opposed to um, just charging what the market demands. So it's just an important thing to kind of consider. And these are challenging things for, for some of these producers to do. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, how to use Google Forms, um, but I think it's really important just the culture of pasture poultry, especially for beginning farmers. So that's the, the, the real, the niche that we're really trying to kind of reach out to today. If you're a beginning farmer, it's really important to start getting good at capturing and just having that data there. So you can look at trends. You don't have to do anything fancy with it, but just so you can start understanding what is your feed conversion ratio. And for every single commercial breed, you can find breed characteristics that will tell you how you're doing relative to um, what the expectation for that breed is. How many eggs are you producing? What's the weight of your eggs? What's your feed conversion ratio? And that's just so you can kind of benchmark yourself against what the kind of industry standard is. And at the end of the day, you don't even want to do that. At the end of the day, you want to benchmark yourself against yourself. But you can't benchmark yourself against yourself if you don't collect some data. So we have a hyperlink here on our, um, on some of our, on, in our resources section that'll kind of walk you through how to make a Google form. Um, however, if you don't like Google Forms, if you don't want anything online in the cloud, whatever it be, if you just like notebooks and pieces of paper, then just use a regular piece of paper and a notebook and you can still keep track of the same data. This is just one option that you have. Um, so what would you keep records of? So I think this is kind of one of the questions that always comes up. What, what are the things that you want to kind of capture? If you have a memory like me, you want to keep records of everything because I can't remember anything. So um, you just have to decide what are the really important pieces of data to capture. I would say that conventional commercial producers keep records of everything. That, however, they don't really use those data. So I, I always joke with them that they collect all this data, they do absolutely nothing with it for the most part, and that's a real problem. If you're not gonna do anything with that data, um, and, and you're not even gonna use it on a rainy day when an outbreak of disease happens or your, 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 your hens are dying, whatever it be, then there's no reason to collect it. But on the left there, you can see kind of a list of some of the things that you might want to start capturing. And the two things that, you know, I'm always keen to kind of understand at some level are at the bottom right, that feed conversion ratio. So the amount of feed that the birds are eating is the numerator and the denominator, the amount of eggs or meat produced. And if you can just start keeping track of that from flock to flock to flock, you can start understanding you know, how much it's costing, how much feed it's costing to produce a pound of meat or to produce um, a case of eggs. And that's a really important essential calculation to understand. And then the other thing that I would start thinking about is this calculation of uniformity. And uniformity is the idea of we want all of our birds, if we got all, if we got 100 chicks in the mail, um, we want all those chicks to be roughly the same weight. So every week or so, we're gonna weigh 30 of those chicks, just randomly 30 of them. And we wanna make sure that the, the distribution, that, that most of the birds are around the same weight. And if they're not uniform, why is that bad? The reason that's bad is because now we have big birds and little birds. And typically, that's a sign that we're not doing something right with our flock. Maybe we don't have enough waters out. If we don't have enough water, that the big birds get the water, and then water is a great predictor of eating feed. So the birds that aren't getting any water, then aren't getting any feed, and that's why we're having this kind of you know, skewed kind of uh, uniformity. So it's just something to keep track of. You don't have to have 100% uniformity, nobody does. But again, you wanna compare yourself to yourself. So if your uniformity is poor, then you can start saying, okay, what are the things that I need to do? Is it more waters? Do I need to put the feed in, 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 in different places? Am I having issues with uh, perches and I'm causing stress in my flock because I, I have just enough perches for half my birds and now I'm causing a lot of stress and stress can affect uniformity. So those are two of the things that you might wanna check. And then the third thing is just something simple like mortality. So if you have a bird die the first week, two birds die the second week and 10 birds die the third week, you wanna be able to capture that. So I can't tell you how many times I talk to producers and they're telling me how much mortality they have or they think they have. And I'm like, well, when did this start? And they're like, eh, I don't, I don't remember exactly. 
So those are hard things I know to do. It's another thing that we have to do. Um, but, but moving to that, to that direction about collecting some data and deciding what, what important data that is is a good thing to start doing. So I think, you know, when you think about what free range is and what pasture it is, um, there are kind of different definitions. There's no legal definition, um, but in general, uh, free range are allowed to have access to the outside, but they uh, typically have a stationary barn. And then the pastured systems typically obviously have grass. So there are some um, larger producers um, that will um, basically uh, work with farmers that require them to have, if they're gonna sell pastured eggs, they actually have to grow pasture. And that can be challenging in California um, because of uh, some of the drought issues we have. So irrigation can be a challenge in that system. Uh, pasture doesn't have to have mobile coops, but it can um, because you usually wanna rotate onto a piece of pasture um, that has grass and allow the grass that's been somewhat denuded to grow back again. Um, I'm not gonna go into that, just in the, in, the, in, the, in the interest of time. So when we think about husbandry, whether we're doing uh, free range or pastured, we wanna think it, we wanna keep things as simple as possible. And at the end of the day, if you can manage feed, light, air, water, space, and sanitation, if you can just think about it from that general perspective, whether you're on a pastured system or whether you're on a free range system, you're gonna do great, okay? And that's because the same thing for raising chicks, okay? When you're raising chicks, feed, water, heat. It's even simpler. You can add all these other ones in addition, but if you can just keep it simple, um, that's gonna be kind of your best friend. Um, feed can be challenging. So I can tell you about a farm I was on a couple of years ago where this person was raising their chicks um, and they had uh, pellets. And I'll show you a picture of what pelleted feed looks like in a, in a minute. But the pelleted feed was made by a, um, a feed mill that typically made pig feed. So pigs have teeth, birds don't have teeth. So these birds, I walked in there and the guy was asking, why are all my birds dying? Why are all my birds dying? And he was going off on you know, the ventilation. He was going off on the the breeder that sent him the birds, you know, was going off in all kinds of different directions. And I could see these birds, these little chicks, they were just ravenously trying to eat the food. And first thing, he had pelleted feed, which I don't like feeding chicks at all. Second thing, I picked up that pelleted feed and I put it between my hands. And that pelleted feed should just grind up nice and easy between your hands. And this stuff was like, it had like glue in it, like Elmer's glue in it basically. And it would not grind up in my hands. And if you looked carefully, first of all, you felt the crop of the chicks and their crop was empty. So there was no, there should be a lot, that crop should be full. So the crop was empty. And then if you looked carefully at where the birds were eating in the, in the little pans where they had their feed, they were just eating the dust from the pellets. So you have those pellets and then you have like little particles that kind of just come off the pelleted feed or just didn't, um, didn't come together in, in the manufacturing of the pellets. So these simple things that you think like the feed mill is gonna be able to do, you, these are the things you have to pay attention to. Light is a real big challenge for pasture producers at certain latitudes. So in general, you're gonna get more egg production on birds that are exposed to about 14 to 16 hours of light. That can be challenging this time of year. So you can offer a supplemental light. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Air is, you know, you think air for pasture poultry producers should not be a huge challenge, right? But sometimes if they're indoors all day long or all evening long, you can get a really strong ammonia smell. Right? So if I walk into a barn and I smell ammonia, the first thing I think about for birds is corneal ulcers. So that strong ammonia can cause corneal ulcers. And it's also a welfare issue then. And welfare issues tie back to production. So you know, when people say, oh, welfare, well, I'm just a farmer, I'm trying to make money, which no farmer ever says, but you know, there is that kind of perception there. So if that was true, um, that, that, then, then that, that, that's just simply not true. Because at the end of the day, if you have a welfare problem, you also have an economic problem. Water, so if it's hot, you need to have birds having access to clean, cool water. It, that for pasture producers, that's probably one of the most challenging things to do. So most of the farms I go to, um, the water systems are really challenging because you basically have to kind of jerry-rig water going to a remote area of a, of a farm, for example. Um, keeping water clean is really, really challenging. And the easiest way to get birds sick with salmonella or campylobacter is to, is to, is to have uh, bacteria poop um, that's in the water and then just have the bird kind of swallow it. So water is a real challenge. 
space. We talked about some of those space issues and space challenges. So um, before you make your coop or you design your coop, those are really important things to think about. And, and sanitation is really important. So usually near waters, I'll see like trough waters or nipple drinkers. And if that water is dripping, drip, 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 what ends up happening is the water now creates an environment that can allow coccidia to persist. persist. It creates an environment that allows E. coli and salmonella to proliferate. Um, so salmonella can be, uh, sanitation, excuse me, can be a huge problem um, as, far as, um, as far as management has been great. So um, there are all kinds of different systems out there and there are advantages and disadvantages to them. Um, the, I wanna kind of just point out the one on the bottom right there. Um, so that one, the birds are out and about, um, but there is no pasture there. It's just a dirt pad. And there's all kinds of arguments about the, the value of that dirt pad. So that dirt pad, if you are a California Department of Food and Agricultural inspector or an FDA inspector going onto a farm, they love that pad, right? Because there's no habitat for wildlife there. And they think, okay, that's great. You have, an, you have no habitat for mice or for waterfowl. No one's gonna come there, right? But a lot of pastured and organic producers you know, want to have and create an environment that they think is more conducive to um, that type of production, pastured poultry production. So they create you know, these lush grass fields. And you can see on the bottom left there, uh, Joel Salatan, who's just this amazing legend. I got a chance to spend a couple weeks out on his farm when I was in vet school, and that guy's brilliant. Um, and, and the amount of work that they do um, is, is just truly incredible. Um, but he lives in Virginia, and there's a lot of rain in Virginia in those mid-Atlantic states, and, and California is a little more challenging. Um, but I just do want to point out that you do create, when you create habitat for your birds, you also create habitat for potentially other animals. And this is where the challenge is, um, is, you know, do you, you have to think about then I'm, I'm going to have a pasture poultry system. I might have more wildlife. So what am I going to do? What kind of fencing am I going to utilize to mitigate wildlife getting in there? What am I going to do at night with my feeders to make sure that any spilled feed doesn't just stay out on that pasture to allow wildlife to get out there? Um, so there are challenges, but, but those can certainly be mitigated um, significantly. So feed, we could have whole talks on feed and we're actually, I think in week, three or four of this, on the Wednesday or Thursday, um, in, in later in January, we're gonna have James Hermes from um, Oregon State come down and do a nutrition talk. Um, he is outstanding. So I am not a nutritionist, um, but, but feed is, is a huge challenge. So I really encourage you, um, even if you aren't interested in nutrition, but if you're, if you're interested in, in being a beginning farmer to, to listen to his talk in, 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 in January. Um, I just want to highlight two things that the starter and the layer rations um, are probably the two most important rations to get right. So the starter ration, so young birds, they're really small, they need lots of protein. Um, and the layer ration, they're bigger, they're fully grown, they're sexually mature now. And now they um, get a much higher calcium uh, and phosphorus in their diet to support bone growth. And also of course to support um, the egg that they're gonna be um, popping out every 25 hours or so. The challenge again, is that if I am a conventional commercial poultry producer, I usually have four or five different rations, right? And all I'm doing is I'm reducing my protein and increasing my energy. Protein is the most expensive thing that you're paying for. So if you are a small producer, let's say you have a hundred birds or a thousand birds or 2000 birds, you typically can only purchase a starter ration and a layer ration, which means you're, you're producing that starter ration, you're not lowering the amount of protein that your birds are getting from their first 18 weeks or so. So for the first 18 weeks, you should be, you should be starting with a starter, and then after four or five weeks, you can move to these grower rations, and energy um, goes up, which is cheap, and protein goes down. Um, and the advantage of that is you're not paying as much from about week five to week 18. So if you're a smaller producer, this is the real challenge. Um, so it's just something to kind of consider. Question. Is there any detrimental effect to feeding too much protein? No, so the question is, is there any detrimental effect to feeding too much protein? Um, not when they're pullets and not when they're, not when they're chicks. It's just an economic kind of challenge to, to, to address. Um, but there are no, if you gave a starter ration um, until they're about 18 weeks of age, that, that would be completely appropriate. You wouldn't have any health effects at all. Good question. 
Um, and question. If you're not growing from wheat or very few or mixed with wheat, would you use it? No. So if you are a commercial, so the question was if you're not growing from wheat, so if you're a layer producer, um, are there fewer amounts, are there fewer rations that you're going to use? And typically you're talking about four, three to five different rations, depending on whatever the nutritionist says for the company, for the, for the large conventional uh, farms. It's interesting from an environmental perspective, you can make an argument, any extra nitrogen that the birds don't need gets pooped out. So now you're actually putting a little more nitrogen on that field. I've never seen a farm that has such high density that that would actually be an issue. Um, but it is something to kind of think about, you know, when we think about some of these density issues, um, as far as all the nitrogen that's going on in that field. That nitrogen actually, in, in smaller appropriate amounts, is completely appropriate and is a, is a good um, uh, nitrogen uh, source to grow all kinds of different crops. So there's uh, several farmers in this area that have these amazing rotational systems and um, they'll rotate their birds have some fallow land and then have uh, fruits and vegetables that are growing on that land um, in, in these kind of rotational manners. And that's some of the stuff that Jill Salatan will do also. Um, I also want to just mention um, crumble versus pellet versus mash. So I like pelleted feed in adult birds um, and in pullets. I like pelleted feed because it's just easier to clean up. Um, it is considered typically, and this is where Dr. Hermes will come in and he'll give you kind of all his opinions on it. It's more considered more digestible so the protein just doesn't have to be in there. It also has to be digestible. Um, so the protein has to be prepared and heated in certain ways to be digestible. Um, cool. Yep, thank you. Um, the crumble and the mash. Um, the, the nice thing about mash, um, for example, and crumble is that you can mix it up a little better. So if I have oyster shell, for example, that I want to mix into my feed, it's a little easier to do with a crumble, for example. But crumbles can get a little messier. And there's more wastage anecdotally um, from, from, and I'd be curious to see what the farmers say on the farmer panel, you get a little more messiness with, with some of these mashes and crumbles. That being said, the one thing I also want to highlight is oyster shell. Um, so most feeds, most commercial feeds will use oyster shell as a source of calcium. Um, one kind of little trick that I heard from a nutritionist a long time ago, which just uh, stuck in my head, is to give oyster shell later at night. And the advantage of giving oyster shell later at night is the birds will typically lay the calcium matrix for their eggs later at night. So you're giving them this kind of extra boost of calcium later at night. Um, so it's just something to think about because I keep having farmers that are asking me like, well, should we give them more feed at the night? Should I give them more corn? It's like, nope, they get enough corn already. Um, that, that, that can cause some liver issues eventually. But if you're going to give them something later, you can top dress some of the feed with calcium at night if you're, if you're motivated. Question. Um, I might be jumping the gun on this, but what about grit? What about grit? Yeah, so, so grit is a controversial topic. Um, so for pastured poultry, if you talk to the pathologists, so people that look at dead birds at the calf's lab at UC Davis, they would tell you that every bird that's outdoors does not need grit because every single time they open up their stomachs, there is basically grit from the ground on there. Now, some people don't like that, especially people that sell grit don't like when I say that, but that I'm just repeating what the, what the pathologists have told me. If we're working in a indoor system, absolutely, then grit would be, would be added. Um, feeders and waters, we don't have enough time to go over them, um, but it's really important to keep them clean. No matter which one you choose, just keep them clean. Um, going back a little bit, yeah. oh, someone asked uh, how you give it to them at night if they're sleeping, or do you just give it to them in the afternoon? Yeah, so give it to them in the late afternoon. Yeah, good question. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about that. So lighting uh, for meat birds, 12 to 14 hours, for layers, 14 to 16 hours. There are a handful of companies out there um, that have uh, all kinds of different lighting mechanisms. You usually wanna put the light, on extra light in the morning um, as opposed to the night. So if you have calculated at the latitude that you're at that your birds are only getting 12 hours of natural light and you want to supplement them with two hours extra, you would put those two hours extra in the morning. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about incandescent versus CFLs versus LEDs. LEDs are expensive, but there's this amazing amount of research on LEDs now and I'm trying to, to kind of hone in on specific wavelengths, but that's, that's for people that are really focusing on some of these um, indoor um, kind of systems. But timers can also be really effective at that. Lots of producers just don't use li extra lighting. 
Um, and I get the sense that they don't, they don't take as much of a hit as I would have expected them to. So it'd be interesting to see what our the people on our panel say about that. Um, okay. So um, as I just mentioned in California, if you're listening to this, you need 144 square inches starting January 1st, 2020 for each one of your birds. For this audience, that probably doesn't matter too much, but just something to be aware of. The, the thing I wanted to highlight is if you look at the animal welfare approved and the certified humane, the animal welfare approved, um, if you want that stamp on there. So these are auditors that are from a private company that will come out there and they will make sure that your birds, among other things, have 1.8 square feet per bird um, indoors and four square, square feet per bird outdoors. And then if you look at Certified Humane, you can see their numbers. The reality is the more I kind of dive into this topic to figure out why, why is four square feet the magic number? Did they do research that shows that um, you know, the cortisol levels were different or production levels were different or mortality and morbidity were different? No. So these are just kind of lines in the sand. But a lot of people want to be able to market their product. And they want to be able to say certified, this is certified humane, right? So it just, it's one of those things. I'm going to skip bedding because bedding is not as big of an issue unless we're moving in, into, into layers. And I'm just going to show you a couple slides on predators. Um, predators are, like I said, um, from our survey, seem to be the number one mortality issue that we're, that we're typically dealing with in these type of systems. Um, and it's a, a specifically a challenge. The one thing I just want to highlight here is that middle picture with fencing. So we try to get, I, I'm a sucker for technology, um, but you know, the, 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 the more that I read and understand about predator control and the more farmers I talk to, fencing is your best friend. But make sure it's good fencing because predators are smart. So I've been on farms um, with people that are wildlife um, and predator specialists and they will literally walk the entire fence line, that outer fence line of like that permanent fence. And if they see gaps, they'll be like, I can see that gaps. I guarantee you a coyote or a raccoon is gonna see that same gap. So make sure that your fence line is plumb to the ground. Rodents, for example, and, and raccoons don't like digging through gravel. So if you can have a big thick layer of gravel there in a perfect world, that will help mitigate some of their ability to get in. Question. A bear. <laughs> I don't think a fence or I don't think gravel is going to help you with a bear. So bears are, you know, that that that's a challenge. Question. Can I address yeah. that just yeah, a little bit? Yeah, um, Electric fence has been our best against anything. Nice. Yep. So some of these electric fences um, can also keep the birds in and keep some predators out. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about, you know, kind of some of the other technologies, but cameras can at least let you know what you're up against, especially in the evening, especially motion activated cameras. And the last thing that I want to end on really quickly is these shade structures. So these are made of PVC pipes. We have them on our website, how to make them. And we've noticed, um, and I'm sure most people know, obviously birds are prey species. So they are going to eat and drink um, in a space that they feel comfortable in. So if you just put, um, you can see our electric fence on the outside there, but if you just let the birds out, they're typically just gonna go feed underneath your coop or in areas where they feel protected. These, these shade structures, if you can just move them around, um, they'll kind of chew down the grass a little. Um, plus you're giving them a place to go to when inevitably you see raptors and other things that are flying around. Typically, I haven't seen very many of these type of things on farms. I know it's another thing to build for a farmer, but it's something to consider, especially when you want the grass to be evenly fertigated and evenly kind of mowed down by the birds. And with that, I'm going to finish up. Um, if you guys have questions, I'll be around. Uh, feel free to email me or call or uh, just reach out to me during the break. Thank you. <laughs>